Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to the Gentleman's Romantic Book Nook. As always, I am your host, Lucky. And I am Mac W. Marnie, broadcasting live from Portland, Oregon. Welcome to the Gentleman's Romantic Book Nook, 10th episode spectacular. I thought we, um, I thought we agreed we weren't going to do that, though, right? Like, oh. I mean, the way we n- number our episodes, it doesn't really, it just doesn't. Oh. You know okay, what I mean? Like, so, no, so just, um. This is the normal. Yeah, yeah. we'll take we'll take it from the top. I'll I'll leave this back in. We'll do the music again. No problem. No problem. Uh, yeah, fine. Okay, here we go. Welcome back, hey, ladies so, and gentlemen. So, luck, lucky. I just uh, it feels weird because I made okay. a cake. Yeah. What? And uh, there are fireworks and stuff. So maybe we just maybe we just go ahead and we just do the tenth episode spectacular. We live um, in we live in different states. Why did you make a cake? Spectacular. Um. Well, you know, I'll describe the cake and its flavor. That seems. I don't want to be rude. It seems a little selfish, I guess. I mean, I I feel like I want to partake in this with you. I mean, we've done 10 whole episodes. We've got dozens of listeners at this point. I, it That's a funny story from episode one. No. I, See, and then we just record all these different little pieces, and then you edit, you edit it together with your magic wand, and we may, it's, it's spectacular. Well, okay. <laughs> Another issue lucky. here. It seem, can my name be in there at any point? Um, okay, 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 how about this? Um, aren't uh-huh. you lucky to be listening to the Gentleman's Romantic Book Nook 10th episode spectacular? Okay, well, if you were looking for your knife back, you should check my back. Because <laughs> I stabbed you in the back. Yeah, because I'm feeling a little just betrayed here. I'm feeling... Oh, okay, guess what? Uh, well, we had a special guest lined up on phone line three. Hmm. You're on line two. Right. And we just lost we just lost them due oh, to time. Who, that's so really thanks. disappointing. Who was it? Okay. Well, as you know, our editor, Gathaniel, is on line one. Yeah. Lucky, you were on line two. Uh-huh. And for a few minutes there, we had David Arquette on the line. Is that the one I who kid you not? Is that the one who played the State Puff Marshmallow Man in Ghostbusters? Uh no. He's the star oh. of Scream and Writing the oh. Bullet. And you let him get away. So well. let's just it's kind of it's kind of ruined now, so let's just. Well, honestly, if anything, uh, I saved just, face because I didn't say I loved your work as the big state puff boy. It's fine. It's fine. Uh, we, yeah, I'm done with the bit. So let's talk about the selection. Um, <laughs> do you want to walk us through the story so far, Lucky? Of course, as always, I have written a short synopsis of what we've gotten through. Um, I always say get gotten through because a lot of our books so far have been challenging. This has not been a challenge. This has been quite the breezy read through. Here is my short synopsis of what has happened so far in the selection. America's singer lives a strained life in the young country of Ilaya, struggling to get by in a restrictive caste system as a musician or a five. Her secret boyfriend, the hunky houseworker and six, Aspen, pressures America to enter the selection, the opportunity to be one of 35 young women in competition to marry Prince Maxon and become the queen of Ilaya. America is chosen and Aspen promptly dumps her. America sees Aspen holding some side piece at the celebration of her selection (laughs) and absolutely dunks on him. As America is whisked away to join the competition, she meets some of the competition and discovers she loves the limelight. We end our reading with America ready to start a new life, leaving her Aspen-sized baggage behind. (laughs) So if you can't tell, Uh, I turned on Aspen very quickly in this first reading. (laughs) Yeah, he's a big old wang. Uh, I do also want to point out that calling the main character a five is a part of the cast system. <laughs> we're not, we wouldn't rank them. Um, although I'd say a five is pretty accurate based on how she sees herself. She goes from a five to a one pretty quickly, I would say, in that last chapter when she finally discovers a limelight. But we will get there. What I'd like to talk about first is this world that we've been placed in, this post-Fourth World War world. <laughs> yeah, that's a good, that's a good alliteration. It's yeah. a post-World War 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 World. Nailed it. And... The, the society has essentially collapsed and then rebuilt itself as a cuckoo bananas bonkers world where people get named insane things and they're all ranked from one to eight. One, one being, being royalty. royalty yeah. And eight being literally homeless. Uh, and while we don't quite understand everything in between, it, they are alluded to. Um, and maybe we can fill in the blanks here. Yeah, we've certainly figured out some of them. We know teachers are threes, which I love. I love that turn. We know soldiers are twos. We know there is a royal cast. We know America Singer, the musician, is cast five. 
Number five, artists, number five, right in the middle, uh, right behind factory laborers and right ahead of indoor slaves. Right, which <laughs> is pretty brutal. I do want to say they base it based off of the help that these people are going to give to the government. So, right. Which is why soldiers are behind this list. So I, I guess I'm curious then if we're going to throw a couple of different jobs back and forth. What what do you think like um, – uh, an influencer would be in this caste system. Um, definitely outdoor slave number seven. Right. Okay. Yikes. It's the word outdoor slave. <laughs> That's what I have written down is indoor slave and outdoor slave for sixes and sevens because they're not like supposed to turn down work. Oh, yeah. I guess I kind of looked over that, right? Like there is this whole scene where she tricks Aspen, a great moment, to come in and talk to her because she offers him like, I have work you need to do. Like cleaning my room. What a crazy... What a crazy thing. And they can afford it now because she's on The Bachelor. What about a professional ice skating maker? They make the ice skates. <laughs> okay, so he makes ice skates. Professionally. Uh, that's an artist, so they're going to be in okay. number five. That's number basically five. Each, each ice skate is its own little sculpture. Okay. And it, each one has its own little brother sculpture, the left, the left skate. Oh, that's nice. I like that. That's sweet. It's like when you put the paw print in the cement so you always remember your pet, even though they're right next to the paw print. <laughs> then your dad lies to you years later and tells you it was your younger brother who was half dog, half boy. And then you had to abandon him on the city outskirts because the police were going to come and take him to the pound. That was a lie? <laughs> oh, I got a call. I got to make a call. <laughs> spots. <laughs> no, not my, my favorite dog, Spots. My brother dog. <laughs> my favorite brother dog. <laughs> I think we can all agree that, like, the process of the selection is inherently sexist. Oh, my God. The entire time, there's so many moments that I'm finding this misogyny buried within. And I think it's interesting because, you know, is it a commentary about – I mean, it can't really be a commentary about current life, right? Because I, I guess they're in – Don't know. Well, I mean, in some ways, it's the way that, like, the attitudes in society towards men, that they have their choice of all these different women. It's that old, like, shitty analogy of, like – a key that opens many locks is a great key, but a lock that opens up to any key is a shitty lock. And it's like, well, that sounds like slut shaming. Yeah, that exactly. And I think that this society so definitely is a shut slamming society. Sh sl <laughs> That's a tongue twister. <laughs> slut shaming society. Slut shaming society. society. Shame, Shame slutting capiety. Capri Sun society. Got it. Okay. Whoop. Little Freudian penis there. Anyway. <laughs> um. <laughs> They've essentially brainwashed the entire society into thinking that this is how relationships should work because America Singer is like, I could take the selection or leave it. And her mother, father, brother, sister, boyfriend, boyfriend, sister, boyfriend's mother and all her friends at school boyfriend, want nothing twin. more than to basically sell her to the Capitol and have her just like ruthlessly compete against 35 girls for the hand of one man she doesn't know, which is like an insane competition to try and like and, and and her family's livelihood is at stake yeah the fact that she's living kind of on the cusp of poverty is put across very early they're barely getting by what they have you know we see that aspen one cast below is so much worse off even in that sense and the opportunity to become a one like never having to worry about food living in a comfortable place i mean she's not even thinking about the status that comes with it it's like wow I, we can eat forever that's like kind of cool <laughs> but then aside from that completely she takes a long time to shit all over how Maxon looks. She does not <laughs> like the aesthetic appeal of this man. It's funny because it seems like America isn't that attracted to Maxon, but Aspen seems kind of gay for Prince Maxon. Because uh, here, here's a paraphrase from uh, one of the early chapters. Uh, Aspen says, uh, it's exciting. He's going to fall in love in front of everyone. Anyone could be our next queen. It's kind of hopeful. Makes me think I could have a happily ever after, too. With Max, he muttered. Uh, I mean you. Oh, boy, so that was a subtext I didn't quite read. There. Yeah. Wow. And then, like a scene later, we have America looking at Prince Max on TV. And she's like, I guess he's handsome in his own way. His hair looks like honey. And he kind of looked like summertime, which I guess is attractive to some people. Wait, she kind of low-key is attracted <laughs> to him reading that out loud. He kind of looks like, you know, this fresh spring breeze on your face. That's true. I guess I wasn't really reading that, that context there. It was really like, he's fine, I guess, anyway. Like, just kind of shitting all over him because she's got so much gaga eyes for Aspen. But, yeah, I guess she's saying that he's got that royal look. She does refer to him as, like, a stuck-up dumperino, though. 
Well, it sounds like it wouldn't be such a great time to be stuck at the castle with him because when, uh, you know, obviously she gets all dolled up and puts her name in for the selection. And oh my God, it was such a twist when she got chosen for the selection. Uh, and then like the authorities come to tell her the rules. And one of the like <laughs> understated rules about the selection is if Prince Maxon wants you to do something, you do it. You got to give it up without fighting at all. And that, you know, she's talking about how sick it makes her, how terrible. She doesn't uh, fight it at all. <laughs> she's just down pretty much. Yeah, she tells Aspen about this and he looks shocked and he's like, what? Before marriage? And it's like, well, dude, he's the, 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 the military is essentially forcing these 35 girls to come to the castle and fight for his hand. And you're shocked that he might get frisky with one of them. It is incredible how The Bachelor has really permeated culture in such a way that in the future we will be basically living Bachelor-style lives. Uh, and it's interesting that she describes Maxon in that way because she describes Aspen as tall, but not too tall. Thin, but not too thin. <laughs> smart, but not too smart. White, but not too white. Yeah, a nondescript, generic-looking person. My dream! We discover before the selection is actually made that Aspen has been saving a little nest egg to tie the knot with. Um, mm, well, yeah. we think to tie the knot with <laughs> America. It seems that way, at least. I, like I said, I turned on Aspen pretty quick. He's a dirty dog, and we will certainly get there. But that, that nest egg was interesting, this opportunity for her to lower herself to a lower class. I mean, she is super will. America is always willing to lower its class, uh, her class, sorry. <laughs> And what's insane to me about Aspen's behavior, and I turned on him, too, when I was reading this this uh, selection of chapters, is he, like, makes her do it. If Aspen had said, don't go, marry me, she'd have done it. And yet, the moment she's on board and ready to go, he shows up and is like, actually, it's kind of a deal breaker you being in this election. It's like, I'm doing it for you. You, to you to basically begged me to go. She also gets a bribe from her mom, which I love. The This, like, her mom is so excited for her to do the competition, you know. There's a lot of chatter about mom doesn't really love me or whatever, but this bribe for her making her own money and this opportunity to have a life for herself was really enticing. That was that was cool to see this opportunity for America to kind of, like, for, to America to bloom and become their own. Yeah, I just want to pop in about her mom and say that uh, I have a fan theory that mom is the mom's name. Oh, my God, we never learned her name. <laughs> They might mention something later, but it's, it's definitely a mom is her name. Dad is his name. And they call she calls her parents by their first names. It's either mom or it's United States of. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, the the weird bribe that the mom, the, the weird bribe that mom gives America in order to basically convince her to sell herself to the capital is sort of like hints at some deeper mother issues throughout the book that either I don't want to say that Kira Cass has mother issues, but America certainly does because her mother as a character is super cold and distant. And the dad is like super warm and intellectual. And at, they really have a loveless marriage. The parents do uh, because at one point the mom says, lucky for me, I got your father. And then America's reaction to that statement is, wow, mom must be in a good mood. I couldn't remember the last time she was that affectionate towards dad. It's like, that's not even did... a physical moment. It, that's not even a compliment. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's like, oh, I enjoy your space near me because of the money. Like there's there's nothing there that's warm at all. But America's just like so floored by this reaction. Of course, we one of the things we learn about this world that like shocked me uh, not so much the World War Four stuff, but that there's no Halloween in this world. Oh my God! Thank you for saying that. I have a huge note saying like I couldn't even imagine living in a world without Halloween. How terrible! I have. There's no Halloween, and that's the scariest thing I've ever heard. <laughs> what do they even do in October? Nothing. Sit around in fear for like world events. That's insane. You gotta sit around in fear for ghouls and ghosts. <laughs> they have a spook collection in October. <laughs> It's sort of like the selection, but with more food costumes. They all draw candy corn, and whoever gets the one that's only one color wins, and they're the spooky <laughs> they get one. Pelt, they get pelted with stones until <laughs> they dead. get stoned to death. <laughs> it's, we replaced um, Halloween with the lottery. It's not stones, it's jawbreakers. <laughs> it's jawbreakers? Oh my god. I, I wanted to. We had to kill them, not torture them to death. <laughs> What's going to break first, the priest says as he hurls a giant jawbreaker at the Chosen. 
Shirley Jackson wept. So we've essentially gotten to the point where she's signed up for the selection. She's going to go. And what I find insane is that in at the end of the day, the selection is 100% voluntary and she could quit at any time. Her family is fine. She doesn't have to do it for Aspen anymore. And it's like, it doesn't really seem like a tragedy. It's not the Hunger Games. No one's like holding a gun to her head and telling her to do this, but she seems so unhappy to be doing it. And even like more and more, she's like, what am I doing here? I, w- I wish I was back at home. And it's like, bitch, you could go home. There's no, there would be no consequence. You'd just be back in your life before. Yeah, there's some incredible family pressure being put on here. I feel like, you know, obviously the bride, the Aspen stuff, you know, she doesn't want to do this at any point. But everyone in her life is telling her this is the right thing to do. And, you know, it's just another option or another moment where somebody is getting to make their own choices based off of, like, family peer pressure. Which I think is probably going to be a pretty regular trope in these romance novels. Right. The chaste young maiden who we specifically learn is a virgin in this. It's a plot point. The government men come to her door and straight up ask her, (laughs) so who's been down there? And, you know, you can be honest with me. I got so nervous at that part because I thought that book was going to go a much different direction. I thought there was going to be like an inspection and some pretty rough stuff ahead. But then I remembered it's a young adult novel. So it was just they took her for a word and she signed a virginity contract, which um, (laughs) I just love. That cracked me up to no end. Oh, you know what? Looking through my notes uh, about mom and dad, we do actually learn her mother and father's names and they're not it does it that's that's not very good but their names are Magda and Shalom so Aww. i don't know if that means they're jewish or uh what but cuz there's a sentence that i wrote down because it was so puzzling i had to read it a few times i believe it's when they're announcing her as part of the selection and uh the mayor is saying how proud they'll all be of of america and the quote is <laughs> And Carolina will be cheering on the beautiful daughter of Magna and Shalom Singer, the new lady America Singer. And I was when I read that, I was like, did Cass, did Kira Cass have a stroke? I had to go through that like five or six times. Not a lot happens in this section of the book with regards to the selection, but we do get like a little hint of it. Lucky, do you want to walk us through sort of like. Those last moments in her hometown and my favorite part was this last chapter where she actually like gets to meet some of her competition and flies out. Um, Do you want to take us through that? To get to that emotional point, she has to go through something um, that I would say is a pretty minor speed bump, like a a nudge in the road (laughs) where um, Aspen has a bout of toxic masculinity for her making a kick-ass dinner for him and dumps her in a treehouse, which – I guess she needed a drive at some what point. What are you, eight years Madison? old, Aspen? My God. Yeah. She he she makes like a kick-ass dinner for him, and he's like, I just can't do this. You're, you're so overbearing. And then the next day when she's having her moment, he's got his hands around another hussy during her big moment. Obviously, she's going to see him. He's got her his hands around, that's right, a butler. And her name is Brianna Butler. Yes, <laughs> a cast six <laughs> named after their job, which we know is a general trope of this book. I'm so I'm over Aspen. Aspen more like ass kin for an ass kicking. Oh, he was Aspen for trouble bringing <laughs> her to the selection. This is it's insane to me. It's insane to me that this man has the gall and then runs up to her in the crowd like, oh, wait, America, man. She gives him the cold <laughs> shoulder. I'm so proud of our girl in this one. Wait, America. What was that chicken recipe you had that night? Because I know we were fighting, but it was looking good, and I really want to make it for Ms. Butler. After you left after the breakup, I did go back and eat the rest of that food. It was I did, incredible. I did, the next morning, I did climb up and eat the entire thing uh, like a squirrel, shoving it into my cheeks for later. But yes, that leads us into this moment of her finally becoming the America we know and love and uh, having this having an airplane ride for the first time and meeting a couple of the other women in our selection. So America gets on the plane and meets her competition for the first time. And it's literally like a nice one, a neutral one. And then the last one's meant to be kind of a bitch, but I don't really see that. It seems like some fabricated drama in my mind. She, to me, is the most prepared. I mean, she's she's in a competition. She's trying to be the queen. She knows exactly how to act. Uh, you're Celeste. talking about um, C- Celeste. Yeah, Celeste yeah, yeah. Newsome, she's, indeed. She's supposed to be, uh, I think you called her the, the, the bad bitch. <laughs> oh, that's my big note. Celeste Newsom is the bad bitch. I mean, it's incredible, like, the energy she's bringing to the table. Kira Cass wants to make you feel like Celeste is kind of a big B, but really, what has she done? 
she comes on the plane and is like, oh, hey, do we know when the plane is taking off? And they're all like, we were waiting for you. That was a and sick, it just, that was a sick moment by America just coming back at Celeste like that. I, that was a power move, though, right? Like it's all we're in the mind game now. This is classic The Bachelor. You come in strong. If somebody throws that heat back at you, you got to stand firm. And Celeste back downs a little bit. I'm a little disappointed. And then the pilot like pokes his head in and Celeste is like, um, oh, hey, honey, when are we taking off? And America is like, oh, so that's her game. That's how she plays it. And it's like, bitch, it's a competition of 35 women competing for one man's hand and a shot at the crown. And you are telling me that like you're, you're so shocked and appalled that she's like has a low cut dress and is being nice to men. I'm hoping in this next reading, she learns something from Celeste. She realizes, hey. I do want the money. I do want the crown. It's time to step my game up. And she goes to the bad <laughs> I, bitch. I do want Celeste. And she comes up and touches her face. America marries Celeste and it becomes a matriarchy. Oh, I like that. That's a fun twist. That's way different than I think they're setting up very often. And as punishment but... to the men, 35 men duke it out. Hunger game style. It's real blood, real gore. And the winner gets to be a hand servant. Wow. This is... um. I wouldn't mind, I guess. No, what what, what weapon better, would you yeah. bring to that fight? Against 35 other dudes to compete for. Yeah, let me set the stage for you. 35 okay. other dudes. Okay. Only oh, okay. I love it so far. Plus. Yeah, hang oh. on. It's getting better. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Big tub of oil, far side of the arena. Four, who knows? <laughs> End of setup. What weapon would you take? There's already a bunch of lube. <laughs> I so... You can use oil for anything. I mean, it's up to you poison interesting how would you utilize the poison would you seduce all of them i would do into the yeah i would do like um did you ever see uh, batman and robin of course i would do the uma thurman uh poisonous lips so, <laughs> so you just have wait to, for him to line up as the other men are fighting each other you pick them off one at a time and seduce them and kiss them kiss them to death <laughs> yeah uh it's a lot of broken alliances to get to the top I like that, though. That I mean, you've got the mindset of one of the selected. You could easily win this competition. <laughs> Do you know what I would bring? Oh, yeah. Deaths, please tell me. A gun. <laughs> and I would unload on <laughs> With those 34 fools. bullets. <laughs> it's 30. It's no. It's high risk, high reward. <laughs> I can't miss. <laughs> one thing the book hasn't addressed yet is that with 35 women living together, eventually their periods are going to sync up, which wouldn't be that bad. It's not the end of the world, right? Like, maybe a little annoying, but I imagine that for Prince Maxon, he's just like his security moves him to a bunker because to the patriarchy, it's like night of the living dead. He's like, he runs into a woman who's just like, oh, do you have an aspirin? And he gasps, oh, it's got you too. God, the woman says, do you have an aspirin? And then America, a singer from around the corner, hears and she goes, oh, aspirin? And then cries again for another <laughs> week. Team aspirin. I'm, just, I'm hashtag team aspirin. <laughs> Uh, um, thank they, you, Aspirin, for sponsoring this week's episode. Aspirin they, gets rid of your hangover. <laughs> if they still made the uh, like the starving games or like not another teen movie movies, mm -hmm. the, the in the parody of this, his name would be Aspirin. Aspirin, you make all my headaches go away. <laughs> Again, are you a you virgin? Aspirin. Uh... aspirin, retain your virginity. <laughs> That's an ad that would play in the world of the selection. <laughs> Aspirin, remember your place in society, you fucking six. Holy shit. They did mention that there are TVs, that people of lower castes can have access to TVs, even though they're only one station. I do wonder about the commercials that show on these. <laughs> Is it stuff like that? Like, enjoy a bowl of macaroni and cheese by falling in line and following the cast order. <laughs> Mail call. Oh, what's that? It's lucky. It looks like we've got our first uh, first piece of fan mail. It finally happened. I'm so excited. What does it say, Mac? Yeah. Can you uh, can well, you put on your yeah, postman's um, hat and let me know? Yeah, it actually came in the mail mail, which is weird, uh, but it is addressed to the gentleman's romantic book nook. So let's see. And I How have not read this. I don't know. Okay. Uh, this letter comes from Kira. Thank you, Kira, who writes, Dear Lucky and Mac. It has been determined that you are using my novel, The Selection, without authorization, which is copyrighted work, in accordance Aww. with Title 17 of the U.S. Code. I demand that you cease and desist use of these properties, otherwise you will be held liable for statutory damages. That's sweet. Thanks for listening, Kira. That means a lot. And to answer your question, we met in college, and we're just best friends who host a podcast together. Um, Lucky is straight. 
a good good piece of mail there. Uh, thanks again, Kira. I'm, f- I'm glad we finally got, A, our first fan mail where they obviously are very interested in us and re- respect what we're doing and want to give yeah. us more monies. Um, and also just like that I'm straight. Finally, it's on the podcast. <laughs> yeah, you're, you're going to come out as hetero. hetero. <laughs> if you have uh, some thoughts and want to maybe have your letter read aloud on the show, feel free to shoot us an email. And that's going to be at grbooknook at gmail.com. Uh, you can find us on Twitter, Instagram, uh, hashtag GRBookNook if you want to talk about the show. The best way you can help us out, though, is by telling your friends and sharing it on your own social medias. We don't do any advertising for the show, let alone what we do on our own social media. So tell a friend, let them know what we're doing out here, that we are a bunch of chuckle busters. I've been advertising the show. Um, what? Yeah, I decided to go old school, do like town crier style. Oh. So I got this, I got a big old bell and I just marched down the street Hey, 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 hey. Any responses from that? Um, yeah, a lot of uh, slammed shut windows. Oh, no. Um, I set off a lot of car alarms, so it's hard to hear. Uh, but we're getting attention. We're getting attention. No bad press. No bad press. There's a lot of chapters to go. We're doing chapters 9 through 16 for this next section. That's going to bring us, like, a chapter-wise, two-thirds of the way through the book. So I think we got a big section ahead. And then we'll be finishing off the last nine chapters after that. Our music for this selection is uh, True Messiah by DJ Freedom. Thank you for letting us use that, DJ Freedom. Hoping to see you pop up at some point in the book. We've had a lot of laugh these 10 episodes, and here's to another 10 as we wrap up the 10th episode spectacular of the Gentleman's Romantic Book Nook. Signing off from Portland, Oregon. Mac, we, every time we talked about this, my dude, people aren't going to like it. We can't. if If we just record it, then we have it. And then, That's we, and, then, and then we have it. It doesn't. Well, I don't want that on my system. I don't want to stumble across the, the fans are going to demand the director's cut of this first season.